Summary Essay on Homo Deus by Yuval Noah Harari A Brief History of Tomorrow Hello, everyone. Welcome to my channel, where I share my thoughts on books that challenge our assumptions and expand our horizons. Today, I'm going to talk about a book that does exactly that, Homo Deus by Yuval Noah Harari. This book is a sequel to his best-selling Sapiens, which traced the history of humankind from the Stone Age to the present. In Homo Deus, Harari shifts his focus from the past to the future and explores what might happen to our species in the 21 ST century and beyond. Harari argues that humans have achieved unprecedented levels of power and prosperity thanks to our ability to cooperate in large numbers and to use science and technology to manipulate the world. He claims that we have overcome the three main challenges that have plagued humanity for millennia, famine, plague, and war. Of course, these problems have not been completely solved, and they still cause suffering to millions of people. But Harari contends that they are no longer inevitable, and that we can manage them with the help of data and algorithms. So, what will we do with our newfound abilities and resources? Harari suggests that we will pursue two new projects, immortality and happiness. He predicts that we will use biotechnology and artificial intelligence to enhance our bodies and minds and to extend our lifespans. He also foresees that we will use neuroscience and psychology to understand and manipulate our emotions and to create virtual realities that cater to our desires. He calls these projects the quest for Homo Deus or the godlike human. But what will be the consequences of these projects? Harari warns that they will create new inequalities and conflicts, and that they will challenge our most fundamental values and beliefs. He questions whether we will remain human, or whether we will become something else. He also asks whether we will retain our free will and agency, or whether we will be controlled by data and algorithms. He challenges us to think about what kind of future we want, and what kind of meaning we can find in a world where humans are no longer the dominant force. In this summary essay, I will give you an overview of Ferrari's main arguments and predictions, and I will also share my own opinions and reflections. I hope you will find this book as fascinating and provocative as I did, and that it will inspire you to think critically and creatively about the future of humanity. Let's begin. The Anthropocene The first part of the book is called The Anthropocene, which refers to the current geological era in which human activity has become the dominant influence on the environment and climate. Harari explains how humans have achieved this status and what it means for the planet and other species. Harari argues that humans have conquered the world because of our unique ability to create and share stories or fictions that enable us to cooperate in large numbers. He calls these stories the human web and he gives examples such as religions, nations, money, and human rights. He claims that these stories are not objective truths, but rather intersubjective realities, meaning that they exist only in our collective imagination and that they depend on our common beliefs and norms. Harari shows how the human web has evolved over time and how it has enabled us to create complex societies and civilizations. He identifies three main revolutions that have shaped the human web, the cognitive revolution, the agricultural revolution, and the scientific revolution. He explains how each of these revolutions has increased our knowledge, power, and impact on the world. The Cognitive Revolution, which occurred about 70,000 years ago, gave us the ability to communicate with language and to create and transmit fictions. This allowed us to form larger and more flexible groups and to spread across the globe. The Agricultural Revolution, which began about 12,000 years ago, gave us the ability to domesticate plants and animals and to produce more food and resources. This allowed us to form sedentary and hierarchical societies and to multiply our population. The Scientific Revolution, which started about 500 years ago, gave us the ability to use observation, experimentation, and mathematics and to discover the laws of nature. This allowed us to develop new technologies and industries and to manipulate the environment and other species. Harari argues that the scientific revolution was the most important and influential of the three because it changed the way we view ourselves and the world. 
He claims that the scientific revolution was based on two key insights, the admission of ignorance and the centrality of observation and mathematics. He explains how these insights led to the development of the scientific method and how they challenged the authority of religions and traditions. He also shows how the scientific revolution was intertwined with other historical processes such as the rise of capitalism, imperialism, and nationalism. Harari contends that the scientific revolution has given us unprecedented power and prosperity, but also unprecedented responsibility and danger. He points out that we have become the dominant force on the planet and that we have altered the ecosystem and the climate in irreversible ways. He warns that we have caused the sixth mass extinction of life on Earth and that we have endangered our own survival. He also notes that we have created new ethical dilemmas and moral questions, such as how to treat animals, how to distribute wealth, and how to regulate technology. Harari concludes this part of the book by asking what is the meaning of human history and what is the purpose of our existence. He suggests that there is no single answer to these questions and that different cultures and individuals have different stories and values. He also proposes that the human web is not a coherent and harmonious system, but rather a chaotic and contradictory network that reflects our diverse and conflicting interests and desires. He invites us to examine our own stories and values and to question their validity and relevance in the face of the challenges and opportunities of the 21 ST century. The Humanist Revolution the second part of the book is called The Humanist Revolution, which refers to the rise of a new worldview that places human feelings and experiences at the center of reality and morality. Harari explains how humanism emerged and how it has shaped our culture and society. Harari argues that humanism is a product of the scientific revolution and that it is based on two main assumptions, that humans have a unique and sacred nature and that humans have free will and agency. He claims that these assumptions are not supported by science, but rather by faith and intuition. He also claims that these assumptions are not universal, but rather specific to modern Western culture. Harari shows how humanism has developed and diversified over time, and how it has influenced various domains of human activity, such as politics, economics, art, and religion. He identifies three main branches of humanism, liberal humanism, socialist humanism, and evolutionary humanism. He explains how each of these branches has a different vision of human nature, human rights, human progress, and human happiness. Liberal humanism, which emerged in the 18th and 19th centuries, is based on the idea that humans are rational and autonomous individuals who have natural rights and liberties, and who can pursue their own happiness and interests. Liberal humanism is the foundation of democracy, capitalism, and liberalism. Socialist humanism, which emerged in the 19th and 20th centuries, is based on the idea that humans are social and cooperative beings who have collective rights and duties and who can achieve their common welfare and equality. Socialist humanism is the foundation of socialism, communism, and social democracy. Evolutionary humanism, which emerged in the 20th century, is based on the idea that humans are biological and competitive organisms who have no inherent rights or values, and who can evolve and improve their fitness and power. Evolutionary humanism is the foundation of fascism, Nazism, and eugenics. Harari argues that humanism has been the dominant worldview of the modern era, and that it has shaped our culture and society in profound ways. He claims that humanism has given us a new source of meaning and authority that is based on our own feelings and experiences rather than on external gods or scriptures. He also claims that humanism has given us a new project and goal that is to maximize human happiness and well-being rather than to obey divine commands or cosmic laws. Harari contends that humanism has been successful and beneficial but also problematic and paradoxical. He points out that humanism has enabled us to overcome famine, plague, and war, and to create unprecedented levels of wealth and health. He also notes that humanism has fostered diversity and tolerance, and has empowered individuals and minorities. But he also warns that humanism has created new inequalities and conflicts, and has threatened the environment and other species. 
He also questions whether humanism has made us happier and more satisfied, or whether it has made us more anxious and depressed. Harari concludes this part of the book by asking whether humanism is still relevant and viable, and whether it can cope with the challenges and opportunities of the 21 ST century. He suggests that humanism is facing a crisis, and that it is being undermined by two new forces, biotechnology and artificial intelligence. He argues that these forces will challenge the assumptions and values of humanism, and that they will create new possibilities and dangers for humanity. He invites us to think about the future of humanism and the future of humanity. The Data Religion The third and final part of the book is called The Data Religion, which refers to a new worldview that places data and algorithms at the center of reality and morality. Harari explains how dataism emerged and how it might shape our culture and society. Harari argues that dataism is a product of the information revolution and that it is based on two main assumptions that the universe is a flow of data and that the value of any phenomenon or entity is determined by its contribution to data processing. He claims that these assumptions are not based on faith or intuition but rather on science and logic. He also claims that these assumptions are not specific to any culture or individual but rather universal and objective Harari shows how dataism has developed and spread over time, and how it has influenced various domains of human activity, such as science, technology, politics, economics, art, and religion. He identifies two main stages of dataism. The first stage, which is still ongoing, is the rise of the internet and the digitalization of information. He explains how this stage has enabled us to collect, store, and analyze massive amounts of data, and to create new technologies and industries, such as Google, Facebook, and Amazon. He also explains how this stage has changed our behavior and cognition, and how it has created new opportunities and challenges, such as the democratization of knowledge, the globalization of communication, and the threat of cyber warfare. The second stage, which is still emerging, is the rise of artificial intelligence and the automation of decision making. He explains how this stage will enable us to create and use algorithms that can process data faster and better than humans, and that can perform tasks and functions that were previously reserved for humans, such as driving, diagnosing, and teaching. He also explains how this stage will change our society and culture, and how it will create new possibilities and dangers, such as the enhancement of human capabilities, the creation of super-intelligent machines, and the loss of human control and relevance. Harari argues that dataism is the most powerful and influential worldview of the 21 ST century, and that it will shape our culture and society in profound ways. He claims that dataism will give us a new source of meaning and authority that is based on data and algorithms rather than on our own feelings and experiences. He also claims that dataism will give us a new project and goal that is to maximize data flow and processing rather than to maximize human happiness and well-being. Harari contends that dataism will be beneficial and liberating, but also problematic and dangerous. He points out that dataism will enable us to solve many of the problems and challenges that we face today and to create new levels of efficiency and innovation. He also notes that dataism will foster integration and cooperation and will transcend the boundaries and divisions of humanism. But he also warns that dataism will create new inequalities and conflicts and that it will threaten the autonomy and dignity of humans. He also questions whether dataism will make us happier and more satisfied, or whether it will make us more dependent and alienated. Harari concludes the book by asking whether dataism is inevitable and desirable, and whether it can cope with the challenges and opportunities of the 21 ST century. He suggests that dataism is not a fate, but a choice, and that we can still influence its direction and outcome. He also suggests that dataism is not a religion, but a science, and that we can still question its assumptions and values. He invites us to think about the future of dataism and the future of humanity. Conclusion So, this was my summary essay on Homo Deus by Yuval Noah Harari. I hope you enjoyed it and that it gave you a good overview of the book and its main ideas. I also hope that it stimulated your curiosity and interest 
and that it encouraged you to read the book yourself or to watch Harari's lectures and interviews on YouTube. I think this book is one of the most important and influential books of our time and that it raises many questions and issues that we need to think about and discuss. As for me, I found this book very fascinating and provocative and I agree with many of Harari's arguments and predictions. I think he is a brilliant and original thinker and a great storyteller. I also think he is a very humble and honest scholar who admits his own limitations and biases and who invites his readers to challenge and criticize his views. I appreciate his courage and his vision and I admire his passion and his style. But I also have some reservations and doubts about some of his claims and conclusions. I think he sometimes overstates his case and he sometimes ignores or dismisses alternative perspectives and evidence. I also think he sometimes simplifies or exaggerates the complexity and diversity of human history and culture. I also think he sometimes underestimates or overlooks the potential and resilience of human creativity and agency. I don't think he is wrong, but I don't think he is right either. I think he is somewhere in between, and I think that's where we should be too. So, what do you think? Do you agree or disagree with Harari? Do you find his book enlightening or alarming? Do you think he is a visionary or a pessimist? Do you think he is a friend or a foe of humanity? Do you think he is a prophet or a heretic? Do you think he is a homo deus or a homo sapiens? Let me know in the comments below and let's have a conversation. Thank you for watching and see you next time.